Summer 2022. All of the Donbass region is occupied by the Russians. All of it? No. Several areas defended by unyielding Ukrainians are still resisting the invader and always will. Unfortunately for Ukraine, the key to its resistance is not any magic potion, but the support of the West. And although things are developing very differently from what the Kremlin has planned, Russia has managed to seize 20% of Ukraine's territory in the first 100 days since the war began. Yes, they failed to take Kyiv and every meter of advance is costing the Russian army dearly. But the same is true for Ukraine, which is losing a large number of men and is seeing a lot of critical infrastructure structure destroyed by Russian attacks. But this time we will move a bit away from the front line, at least from what we all identify as such. Because what we want to do with this video is to take a look at the role being played in the war by something that was announced by the President of Ukraine on February the 24th, on the same day that the invasion began. Zelensky said this. What do you want to do with Ukraine? Help national Ukraine та підрозділів територіальної оборони. Будь-який громадянин з бойовим досвідом буде зараз корисним. You see, visual politic viewers, these territorial defense units are a component of the military reserve of the armed forces of Ukraine. They have been mobilized since the end of February and, in recent years, have significantly improved their capabilities. So the question we're asking today is, at what point did the territorial defense forces emerge? How are they organized? And what is their modus operandi? And most importantly, what role are they playing in the current conflict with Russia? Today on Visual Politic, we're going to answer all of these questions. But first, let's look at a bit of history. The Rose and the Sword The disintegration of the Soviet Union created great uncertainty. In addition to Russia, three other former Soviet republics had nuclear weapons remaining on their territory. This was the case in Belarus, Kazakhstan, and of course, Ukraine, where no less than the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world was at the disposal of the new government in Kyiv. And at that time, the Cold War had just ended. As you can imagine, after spending decades on the brink of nuclear apocalypse, having three new countries join the nuclear weapons club didn't seem like the best idea. So as we say on Visual Politic, no sooner said than done. In 1994, the United States, the UK, and Russia signed the Budapest Memorandum with the former Soviet republics. This agreement meant that these countries handed over their nuclear arsenal to Russia in exchange for security guarantees from the United States, Great Britain, and, ironically, Russia itself. And naturally, such an agreement was not the best incentive for Ukraine to invest in defense and modernize its army. <laughs> Like so much else from the Soviet era, compulsory military service is a relic that independent Ukraine has been trying to get rid of for decades. The three years of military service from the days of the USSR has been reduced to between 12 and 18 months. Military service was abolished in 2013, but reinstated the following year after Russia began seizing Ukrainian territory. By then, the people of Ukraine had already risen up twice against Putin's puppet, President Viktor Yanukovych, once in the Orange Revolution for rigging the elections, and a second time in the Euromaidan for breaking an association agreement with the European Union. It was the moment when they learned for the first time that opposing Putin does not come for free. Ukrainians got a bit of a reality check. The annexation of Crimea and the start of hostilities in the Donbass by pro-Russian guerrillas exposed their authorities. That Ukraine had only 6,000 combat-ready soldiers was the result of decades of corruption, a disaster that they have been trying to solve in recent years. As you can see, Ukraine has invested heavily in modernizing its military since the Crimean invasion. It seems to have become clear to them that the Budapest Memorandum is already less value than the Warsaw Pact. But in 2014, Ukraine's problem was obvious. The regular army was insufficient and had a budget that was barely around 2% of GDP of one of the poorest countries in all of Europe. This means that in 2014, military spending barely exceeded 2.5 billion US dollars, a clearly insufficient amount for what is the largest country in the entire old continent. Faced with such a scenario, Ukraine entrusted its fate to volunteer organizations that were ready to defend their homeland. The Donbass War caused a major headache in Kyiv. Faced with the Russian tactic of supporting the Donetsk and Luhansk guerrillas, as well as various insurgent groups, Ukraine bet on a force halfway between civilian and military. They wanted it to be able to organize a guerrilla force in the Russian rearguard that would make the invaders uncomfortable. And that, on its own terrain, would be useful as a complement to the national army. It was the time of the so-called Territorial Defense Battalions. 
as you well know, the conflict in the Donbass extended to the present day. So one concern that immediately arose in the Ukrainian government was how to absorb these territorial defense battalions into the state structure itself. For years, there was an external political debate about what their competencies and tasks would be. But the idea has always been that they should be complement to the army, without ever pretending to replace that role. The fact is that the matter dragged on for so long that it was not until the 1st of January that the law on the foundations of national resistance came into force. It was then that all these battalions were incorporated into a new body, the Territorial Defense Forces. A new body was created just 50 days before the beginning of the Russian invasion. In total, the Territorial Defense Forces consist of 25 brigades, each serving the military command of each oblast, that is, each region of Ukraine. All are ultimately coordinated by their headquarters located in Kyiv. The law stipulates that each brigade was to enlist about 3,500 men, divided into battalions of 600. This means that the Territorial Defense Forces would have about 90,000 troops. Just 20 days after the law came into force, the then head of the forces assured that they were ready and already prepared. And so, while Russia was constantly building up its forces on the Ukrainian border, the message that Kyiv was sending was that they were ready, that things had changed, and that this time they were not going to be caught by surprise, which was exactly what happened in 2014. Yuri Halushkin, Territorial Defense Force Commander. The Territorial Defense Force's demand for firearms and ammunition is fully covered. As brigades were formed in the territories that were already in conflict, such as Donetsk and Luhansk, it is clear that Kyiv was already thinking that these forces should act as a kind of guerrilla or resistance movement if the Russians eventually pushed into Ukraine. Something like a partisan force to keep the flame alive. <laughs> core to control the security of the territory, provide logistical support for the troops, intelligence, carry out ambushes and sabotage operations, as well as build and repair military infrastructure. The idea was to make the defence much denser and therefore to make it much more difficult for the invader to control the territory. The thing is, as you all know, the invasion finally happened. So the question is, what has the Territorial Defence Force done since then? What role is it playing in the war in Ukraine? Well, let's take a look. The Big Ditch. On the 24th of February 2022, the invasion of Ukraine began. The initial Russian advance was devastating. Advancing from Belarus, they tried to encircle Kyiv. In the east, they reached the vicinity of Kharkiv and reasserted their hold on Donetsk and Luhansk. In the south, they advanced from the Crimea and took Metropol and Kherson before beginning the brutal siege of Mariupol. At this point, Ukrainians in the occupied areas had to put into practice what they had learned over the past few years. Our people are doing everything to make sure the land burns under the feet of the occupiers. Ivan Fedorov, mayor of military. Since the beginning of the invasion, many Ukrainians have joined the Territorial Defense Forces. Official figures indicate that in March, there were already about 100,000 of them. The truth is that Ukraine is not having troop problems. But now, we must differentiate between two very different types of soldiers in these forces. On the one hand, the civilian volunteer who, hopefully before the invasion, spent a weekend or two in training but who clearly lacks military knowledge. On the other hand, there are the professionals from the armed forces and other security corps who are the ones who occupy the role of officers within these corps. In fact, many veterans of the Donbass War chose to join these forces, so in need of experienced units to instruct and guide the new volunteers they were. The problem today is that many of these soldiers have chosen to go to the front, where they are much better paid and where they can make a greater contribution to the national defense. In any case, one of the main advantages of civilian volunteers is their knowledge of the local terrain. Playing on home ground gives them an advantage in identifying key places to defend, organizing ambushes, and quickly detecting Russian infiltrators. Most of the arrests of sabotage groups working for the Kremlin in Ukraine are thanks to them. And of course, these volunteers have been armed from day one since President Zelensky declared martial law. Weapons to anyone across Ukraine, militias form as Russian forces near. You see, visual politic fans, the fundamental objective of the Territorial Defense Force is to carry out basic tasks far from the front line, but requiring a high number of troops. We are talking, for example, about setting up checkpoints on main roads, digging trenches and ditches, surveillance and monitoring, fortifying positions and barricades, activities from which the army personnel themselves are intended to be freed up so they can focus entirely on combat missions. Then, another function assigned to the Territorial Defense Forces is to actively participate in the search and detection of the retreating enemy. For example, they are capable of quite efficiently conducting so-called mopping up operations, which includes tracking and capturing Russian pilots of downed aircraft and helicopters. The goal is clear, not to leave a single enemy behind in order to protect the rear guard of the Ukrainian army. 
Of course, in the occupied territories, their work is much more dangerous. It takes as much courage for their activities as Ukrainian soldiers are showing on the front line. Still, the news coming from these areas is constant. From attacks on a Russian-controlled airbase to the destruction of an armored train and railway facilities in Metropole, everything is being used to fight the Russian invader. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Check this out. Ukrainian civilians kill Russian soldiers with poisoned cakes. Report. What is clear is that life has changed a lot in the country for those who, before the 24th of February, were teachers, engineers, workers, and also for Ukrainian companies. Overnight, they have become part of a war economy that is working day in and day out with a single goal, to drive out the Russians. And just as the people of Ukraine have put themselves at the service of the homeland with their territorial defense forces, there are companies that are doing exactly the same. Last month, they made designer dresses. Now they're making combat boots. Ukraine's success in defending Kyiv caused the Russians to shift their focus of the offensive to the east and south of the country. Moving the enemy away from the capital has made it possible for thousands of Territorial Defense Forces troops to be at the disposal of the military commanders to act closer to the front. Of course, there are doubts as to whether or not this is the most convenient thing to do. Check this out. The Fight of the Bosses Zelensky has always been in favor of Ukraine having a more professional army. Three weeks before the war began, the Ukrainian president signed a decree in which he made a clear commitment to increase the defense budget and raise the salaries of his armed forces. Similarly, the end of compulsory military service was set for 2024. But, of course, the Russian invasion has changed everything, and apparently also Zelensky's own opinion. This has led to surprising news in mid-May that has no official explanation. Zelensky fires head of Territorial Defense Forces of Ukraine. Why was Yuri Halushkin fired after 80 days of war? Wasn't he doing a good job? In view of how Ukraine has defended itself, it is clear that this cannot be the reason. So let's see. Certainly the credit for repelling the Russians must go to the courage of the Ukrainian soldiers, but good work has also been done on the second line. So what was the reason for his dismissal? At the time, there were rumors that Halushkin might have a certain aspirations to enter politics. Does this explain why Zelensky wanted to get rid of him before he began popularity and could become a political rival? The truth is that it's kind of hard to believe that the Ukrainian president has time for this type of scheming. He has enough on his hands trying to kick the Russians out. So the key to this dismissal perhaps has more to do with a piece of news that came out just two weeks before his dismissal. Look at what the Ukrainian parliament passed in early May. RADA allows territorial defense to carry out tasks in area of warfare. Thus, the RADA amended the law on the fundamentals of national resistance four months after it came into force. The main change is that the Territorial Defense Forces will operate on the entire territory of Ukraine, including areas of military and combat operations. Another detail is also very significant. The decision to go into these areas will be made not by the commander of the Territorial Defense Forces, but the commander-in-chief of the Armed Forces of Ukraine. And pay close attention to the way in which this legislative reform has been improved. Let me explain. According to Article 94 of the Constitution of Ukraine, the head of state must sign a law sent to him within 15 days or return it to Parliament with reasonable and motivated proposals. If the President does not sign the law within the said period and does not send it to the Parliament, then the law comes into force. This is what happened with this reform as Zelensky failed to sign and return it within the relevant period after it was approved by the Rada. Why did Zelensky not follow the usual procedure outlined by the Constitution? Possibly, we are facing a sign that the desire of the military commanders to gain more troops to fight the Russians at the front has prevailed. Perhaps the president did not want to sign the law, putting the onus of equating civilian volunteers with professional soldiers on the Rada parliamentarians who passed the law themselves. However, everything indicates that the commander of the Territorial Defense Forces strongly opposed the decision to send his members to fight. So much so that Zelensky had no choice but to dismiss him. The thing is, Halushkin is not the only one who thinks that the Territorial Defense Forces are not ready to fight on the front line. Mac William Bishop, who has a military background and is a freelance journalist working with the prestigious international media outlets, is on the ground and thinks exactly the same. Ukraine has rushed all available units into the fight in the east, including a number of poorly trained Territorial Defense Forces brigades and volunteer units. I spent time with one of the volunteer units being rushed to the front, and it was an alarming experience. Through no fault of their own, they were being sent into battle with minimal equipment and even a lack of basic training. Bishop's analysis suggests that these units remain unprepared for the battlefield. They are clueless about the most basic infantry tactics, making them an easy target for the Russians. 
It is clear that the Ukrainians are willing to give everything for their homeland, even their lives. But as you understand, it's not about making sacrifices in vain either. In order to fulfill their mission, the Ukrainians need two things, modern weapons, and training. For the former, they can count on the help of the West. Training, though, is more complicated. This takes time, and in war, that is a scarce commodity. Be that as it may, one thing is clear. This territorial defense force is playing a very relevant role in Ukraine. So much so that countries like Poland have already started to copy this structure. But having said all that, do you agree with using all available troops to fight the Russian invader? Leave us your answer in the comments. As always, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to VisualPolitik so that we know that you like our stuff. All the best, and I'll see you next time.